And now it's really a great pleasure and privilege to introduce to you our featured scholar for this evening. Nomi Seidman is the Chancellor Jackman Professor of the Arts in the Department for the Study of Religion and in the Center for Diaspora and Transnational Studies at the University of Toronto and a 2016 Guggenheim Fellow. Her scholarship and extensive publications are characterized by an astonishing breadth of inquiry, situating Jewish cultures within literature, gender studies, translation studies, and modernity writ large. And if that were not enough, Professor Seidman is also a skillful translator. And if that weren't enough, she also has a new podcast out, A Heretic in the House. Her many publications have been widely acclaimed. Her most recent book is Sarah Schneer and the Beis Yaakov Movement, A Revolution in the Name of Tradition, out in 2019. It won a National Book Award in Women's Studies. She is currently completing a book on Freud and Jewish languages. Please join me in welcoming Noli Seidman. Thank you so much. Let me see, I don't want to forget anyone. First of all, thank you, Professor Paradise, for that wonderful introduction and your generous hospitality. And to Mariel, I don't know where she is. This is the most organized. I can't believe I had an itinerary and someone picking me up. And I'm extremely disorganized. I basically need my whole life, whoever Mariel is, if she's looking for a job, just that was really great. And where's Rabbi Davis? Thank you so much for hosting us here. It's really nice to be here. And thank you, thank you all for coming through whatever that is out there. Um, but I'm coming from Toronto, so I'm not that surprised. Um, I, let me start by saying, by asking whether there are any Beis Yaakov girls. Yay, OK. So um, and right, if you ever went to a Beis Yaakov, you're a Beis Yaakov girl for your whole life. That's the terminology, right? Um, or, and it's also an identity, and I am too. Did you go to Beis Yaakov here? Yeah. Ah, thank you. Are there any other people who know what Beis Yaakov is? Okay, so almost everyone. So I won't do the, maybe I'll just give you an extremely brief introduction at a certain moment. But basically I want to talk about something, some little, did you know about the 93 Beis Yaakov girls? You knew nothing about it. Okay, so I want to talk about a really remarkable episode in Beis Yaakov history. And this is one that I didn't talk about in my book, but I've been thinking about it ever since then. And I'm still in the process of gathering material and trying to figure out what, what this episode was. And I'm gonna just give you a little peek into my research and one aspect of the story. And the episode is a story, and you see here the New York Times uh, article from January 8th, 1943. Um, and it's a story of 93 girls from the Krakow Teacher Seminary, as the story becomes clear, although they're often identified as having been from Warsaw, apparently because the Warsaw Seminary, the Warsaw Ghetto was the most famous one. And the New York Times, as we all know, gets things wrong. So they got this wrong. Um, so these were 93 girls from a teacher's seminary who committed suicide in the ghetto, whichever ghetto it was, before they could be taken as prostitutes for the German army. And this story first appeared in the New York Times about six months after the suicides were supposed to have, been, to have taken place. Um, now, the, who were these Beis Yaakov girls? Let me just... For those three or four people out there who don't know, let me just give you a quick canned summary of what is Beis Yaakov, what was Beis Yaakov. So um, this is um, Sarah Schneer, the legendary founder of the Beis Yaakov movement. And I never really know how to show her picture because you will know why I have that problem. Do you want to say? We do know that it's actually her photograph, but we didn't have a photo of her for a very long time. And in Beis Yaakov, sometimes they say she was too modest to have her photo taken. Not really true, but let's just leave that story. She didn't want her photo to be publicized in the system, nothing to do with modesty. She thought she was ugly. And so when we do now have her photo, I actually laid hands on it in the Krakow archive a few months ago, and there it is. And my compromise is that I show it very small 
to people who don't have great eyesight. <laughs> so that's Sarah Schneer. And she's, she isn't just the founder of Beis Yaakov. She's the mother of Beis Yaakov. The way it goes is, right, Sarah Schneer unfortunately never had children, but every Beis Yaakov girl who ever lives, live, lived or lives, is her daughter in some spiritual sense, which means you and I are sisters. So, hi. <laughs> um, and this Sarah Schneer's memory is venerated throughout the school system. In fact, it, it's possible that it's the one thing that unites the school system, which no longer has a central office to unite it, which is united by the memory of its origins, its founding in Krakow in 1917 in Poland by a seamstress, a divorced seamstress, though they don't like to use that word, in Beis Yaakov, with an eighth grade education. So that is Sarah Schneer. Um, I'll just show you, I'm sorry, my computer's so slow. Um, this is a map from 1931. I love old maps, that's why I'm showing this to you. Um, it's a map of what the school system looked like in 1931, done by a group of visiting German Jewish Orthodox activists and dignitaries. Um, German Jewish, uh, Ger German Orthodoxy supported the school system and you know, took trips to Poland to check on it. And that's how this map was produced and that's why it's in German. Um, and there's also, by 1931, it was, also, it was already an international school system. So we're talking, um, it was already in Romania and Hungary, Czechoslovakia, Austria. Um, by the end of the 30s, it would be in the land of Israel. First Beis Yaakov was founded in Tel Aviv on a few park benches on uh, Rothschild Boulevard because they couldn't afford a building. Um, and it was already in the United States where it was uh, 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 the first Beis Yaakov in, Williamsburg, in the United States was founded in Williamsburg in 1937 by a student of Sarah Schneer. And um, since then, it's grown tremendously. And now I have a project called the Beis Yaakov Project. And our first item of business is just to count every Beis Yaakov school in the world. I was just telling someone over dinner, there are five in Buenos Aires. There are Beis Yaakovs, and there's a Beis Yaakov a few blocks away from here. Um, they're in Mexico City, in, there are five in Toronto, et cetera, et cetera. There are now, uh, we're somewhere around 1,300 schools in 13 countries. So we're talking about a transnational school system united by the memory of its Polish origins and the veneration of its female founder. Um, so I think this is a fascinating thing and little enough understood. And let me just show you a picture of the um, this is the crown jewel of the system. By 19, uh, 1931, it opened up. Um, by 1935, there were three teacher seminaries, one in Vienna, uh, one in um, Krakow, this one, and one in Chernovitz, uh, which my mother went to. And um, my mother had just turned 100 uh, in August. And um, by 1937, there was already one in New York. So this, but this one was the only one that had its own building and Sarah Schneer was affiliated with it. And this is where the suicides were said to have taken place when the whole story was uh, told. And there's some pictures of what it looks like now. It's now been, is owned by the Jewish community. Have you been there? It's owned by the Jewish community again. There's a kosher kitchen on the first floor. Um, and I could talk more about that. I just spent the, a lot of time in that building filming this summer. Um, this is just, I love to show these pictures. When I was, after I already, the book was already in press, but before it was in print, um, someone contacted me and said, I had about 50 photos of Beis Yaakov from various archives, and this, and we picked three or four for the um, book, and someone contacted me, a professor at Concordia in, in Montreal, and said, you know, I have my grandmother, I'm really sorry, but she wrote on them, I have all these photos from my grandmother who went to Beis Yaakov and graduated, there's her graduation certificate, 1934, and then, are you interested? I'm like, how many do you have? He said, I think they're around 100. I was like, yes, I'm interested. So, anyway, th this is all of the graduation and then a cart ride and then the celebration hike in Poland of the class of 1934 in the Krakow Teacher Seminary. And these are just among the most beautiful ones. So even though it's not directly related to the subject of this talk, 
I feel as if we should remember this world, this life, and if we're going to talk about the Holocaust, we should also talk about this. Okay, so I'll let you look at that while I tell you a little bit more about this shocking news story, which spread quickly throughout the Jewish world, the whole free Jewish world, um, far beyond Beis Yaakov circles. Um, there were many rabbis uh, sermonized on the story after it was in the New York Times, it was in every Jewish newspaper all over. All denominations, rabbis talked about this. There were many memorial events. It was poetry, there were plays. Um, and in the land of Israel, let's see. Hope I have this, sorry. Here we go. Um, in the land of Israel, there are at least five streets named after the 93. That is called Gana Teshim Shalosh, the park of the 93 in Bnei Barak. Um, there's uh, a grove of trees dedicated to them. And I just want you to understand that this is far beyond the narrow world that we now think of as Orthodox Jewish girl dumb, if that's the way to describe this. Um, so let me, um, oh, and here's the story about the thousand tree grove in Palestine to honor Poland's girl martyrs. And just to give you a sense of what we're talking about. So this is the letter. So what did the New York Times um, report? It reported that a letter had arrived in New York purportedly from the leader of these girls written in the final hours. OK, I so see all you people are reading ahead, so I'm going to stop you from doing that. I do the same. <laughs> it's like you can't you gotta listen to me and read. OK, so um, in, it circulated in various forms and in many languages. It's sometimes called the last will and testament of the 93. And I'll read till the part I excerpted on the slide, and then I'll let you read along, or I'll just summarize it. So my dear friend, um, I'm, I'm reading from the fullest version that we have, which was censored in the New York Times because of they were covering up the identity of some of these people, not to endanger them, I guess. Um, so this is how it starts. My dear friend, Mr. Shankolevsky in New York, and Mr. Shankolevsky, Mayor Shankolevsky, actually was the head of the Beis Yaakov Committee in New York. So she, this young woman in the Krakow Seminary is described as directing her letter to him. I, don't, I do not know whether this letter will reach you. The letter, by the way, was in Yiddish. I should have said that. Do you know who I am? We met at the house of Mrs. Schneerer and later in Marienbad, probably referring to the 1937 Marienbad um, Aguda Conference, the conference of the um, political organization of Orthodox Jews. When this letter will reach you, I will no longer be among the living. Together with me are 92 girls from Beis Yaakov. In a few hours, all will be over. Regards to Mr. Rosenheim and to our friend Gut Goodman, both in England. We all met in Warsaw at our friend, and his son was also there. We had four rooms. On July 27th, we were arrested and thrown into a dark room. We had only water. We learned David by heart, Tehillim, Psalms, and took courage. We are girls between 14 and 22 years of age. The young ones are frightened. I am learning our mother Sarah's Torah with them, that it is good to live for God, but it is also good to die for him. Yesterday and the day before, we were given warm water to wash, and we were told, I think this is, you could read along, um, and we were told that German soldiers would visit us this evening. Yesterday, we all swore to die. Today, we were all taken out to a large apartment with four well-lit rooms and beautiful beds. The Germans don't know that this, is our, that this bath is our purification bath before death. Today, everything was taken from us and we were given nightgowns. We all have poison. When the soldiers, soldiers will come, we will take it. Today, we are together and learning the confession all day long. We are not afraid. Thank you, my good friend, for everything. We have one request. Say Kaddish for us, your 93 children. Soon we will be with our mother, Sarah. Yours, Chaya Feldman from Krakow. The first academic studies of this episode revolved around the question of its authenticity. 
And rapidly, scholars decided that the story was a pious fiction. And it would be possible to say, OK, this never happened. And there are all kinds of reasons that we know or think that this never happened. Um, and I certainly respect historians who go, OK, case closed. But here, my interest in what I think that for someone like me to say that the story never happened is actually the beginning of where your research starts. What does it mean that the story that never happened circulated throughout the Orthodox world in all the various ways it did? And that certainly is part of history. So uh, in this particular talk, I'm going to focus on the meaning of this fictional story. Um, so what it tells us about Orthodox culture. Um, and that, that story is only made more interesting by the evident fact that the story is fictional. Um, and I'll just say a couple of things that are very striking to me. So some of you may know that there's an entire field of feminist Holocaust studies. And the usual, what people in that field say is that in Holocaust history, women who were sexually violated, and it wasn't only women, anyone who was sexually violated, did not tell their story um, sometimes for decades for all kinds of reasons that you can imagine, that this is one of the most suppressed aspects of Holocaust history. So it's certainly striking that in the New York Times in 1943, there's a story like this. Um, and then to just add to the remarkable character of this story, let's point out that this story involves what must be one of the most sexually modest cultures in world history, maybe, which is the ultra-Orthodox community. So how is it that a story about ultra-Orthodox girls, um, while the Holocaust is actually happening, um, and in a culture in which these sorts of things are supposedly not said, how this becomes front, well, not front page in the New York Times, but elsewhere it was, how this becomes so important in Orthodox culture, and how do we understand this? Um, the, the breaking of the taboos that this required in order to be told um, is really, I think, a mystery that I don't claim to entirely solve. Um, and I'll just say that the, the, the particular combination of, let's call it female modesty and pornography, those things are not as opposite as you might think. They go together in right the ravishing of the virgins. Um, Though they've long been kind of peculiarly intermixed in a kind of potent brew of, what did I call it here? Um, I, I, I think I had it of kitsch and death and sex and violence and religion, just to make it all fit together. So there are certainly you know, religious martyrologies from late antiquity, from antiquity, have this same particular, I don't know what you want to call it, ingredient list. Um, and there's also the whole issue of how this is a kind of Holocaust fantasy, right? Like the idea we're given these, we're given these, somehow the German soldiers are not in the story, they're outside for long enough for these girls to take a nice long bath and to, I don't know, learn with each other before they swallow the conveniently available poison, right? Most, and they're, together, right? They're not, they're not with a bunch of strangers in a cattle car. It's like, in terms of a Holocaust death, let's say this is a kind of beautiful one. Um, and it's also one, I mean, I would just say that to, be, to begin with thinking about what this is about, the question of sex and girls and religion was part of the story of Besiakov from the outset. Since Besiakov was founded because of the threat of, among other things, what was then called the international white slave trade. So the fact that girls, even from Hasidic homes in Poland, were leaving the Orthodox community in droves, um, sometimes to join radical movements, but sometimes to become prostitutes, either willingly or seduced by strangers, big debates about that. But the whole question of Jewish, of, of the sexual vulnerability of Jewish women is part of the reasons that the reason that the rabbis saw fit to allow this innovation of Orthodox girls' education. Um, the kind of trauma of girls scandalizing rabbis 
um, is what achieved a certain kind of loose, loosening of the usual halachic rules that made it difficult to educate girls formally. Okay, so um, in the case of these 93, you can say here that that drama of girls leaving orthodoxy to become prostitutes or to become communists or to become secular, that that just is kind of the same story in much more extreme and violent and Manichaean terms. Um, and it's also interesting to me that a kind of slogan, there are has many slogans, including one of the ones cited in the, in, in the letter, worship God with joy, if do us Hashem b'simcha. Um, but an, another one of the slogans that was almost a joke slogan was, b'makom she'en ish, b'makom she'en bo ish. Um, long story around that, but in a place where there is no man, no man, and in the ethics of the fathers, it goes on, try to be a man. In Beis Yaakov, it was in a place where there is no man, which is Beis Yaakov, right? The men are not there. Um, girls have to do what men normally did. So in the place where there is no man, there's no Jewish man supervising these 93 girls, you take a pill, you take a poison pill, rather than allow yourself to be used as a prostitute by the German soldiers. So there's a kind of coherence to the way this story fits into a Beis Yaakov ethos, um, even in these extreme circumstances. So what I'd like to do for the rest of this paper, and I'm sorry, I feel like I've been talking for a long time and I forgot to look at my watch. 40 minutes, right? I'll, I'll, I'll try to make it quick. So, um, so what I want to talk about in this, uh, in, in this talk is just a little snapshot of what this story looked like in the 40s in Palestine, from 1943 to 1947. I'm just like, I've been fascinated by this story for a decade now. I just, I Google Beis Yaakov, I Google the 93, I'm constantly trying to find references to it. And I found these two booklets on eBay, and these two booklets are what are gonna be what I talk about for the rest of this talk. And I'll explain what these booklets are. So um, Palestine was one of the two locations where Beis Yaakov moved to. Um, well, while the Polish center was still alive, it was actually the place of first expansion. Um, after Europe, it went to Palestine and Tel Aviv. Jerusalem, it was too modern for Jerusalem at the time, but eventually it ended up in Jerusalem too. Um, and Tel Aviv is actually where this story plays itself out. The first location of Beis Yaakov in the land of Israel. Um, and the first major Beis Yaakov center outside of Europe. Um, and one of the things that interests me, which I've already signaled, is what role does the Polish center play? And the Polish center in its destruction, in its moment of destruction, in the creation of a new center, because the new centers would be the United States or North America and Palestine, the land of Israel, um, what role did the memory of the Krakow Seminary play in the founding of these new centers, and in particular at the moment when these centers were being destroyed, uh, when the European center was being destroyed? And I just want to point out that the, the Krakow Seminary was the place of the, the most elite it was very hard to get into. It was kind of like the Harvard of all the Beis Yaakov possibilities, the way the Yeshiva, um, Yeshiva Shachmei Lublin, people talked about that as the Harvard of the Yeshiva system, an elite place where the girls got good food and they weren't treated you know, the way they sometimes are in some of the second-rate places. Um, so what are these um, booklets? So when I first looked at them, they looked quite similar. There are two booklets, this one, um, 93, um, in memory of the 93 of our sisters from Poland um, that chose to die, that chose a holy death to not be um, put into, uh, I can't even read that, uh, not to be given over to shamefulness. I'm sorry, that's a bad translation. Now that you said I'm such a great trans translator. I would not put that in a published thing. Not to be given over to shamefulness. Okay, I'll come up with a better one. Um, and then this one, Kiddush Hashem, the heroic death, or you know, dying for the sanctification of God's name, 
the heroic death of the 93 Besyakov girls from the Krakow ghetto. So this is from 1947. Um, the first one is 30 pages, this one is 39 pages. By 1947, they already knew that it was Krakow and not Warsaw. Um, and, and here, some eyewitnesses account, accounts. That's the biggest difference. I'll get to that in a minute. Um, so both, both of these texts, both of these uh, provide the poems, um, stories, etc., and they both provide a text of the last will and testament of the 93. Um, and they retell the story and they frame the story with supporting texts and speeches. Um, they provide the Hebrew translation. But one is, I think you could see, much better produced. Um, and it, what's so interesting about it is that it's uh, not a Xerox or whatever, the 1947 that wasn't Xerox. It's a printed book that's put together by something called Hava'ad Lahagana Al Kavod Bat Yisrael. Anyone want to translate? Council for the Defense of the Honor of the Daughters of Israel. Yeah, I think I would say the committee. The committee for the defense of the honor of the Jewish daughter or the daughter of Israel. Right. So um, who was the council for the, who and what are the council for the defense of the Jewish daughter, or the honor of the Jewish daughter, and may I never meet them. Um, they're a very odd alliance of, um, I would say kind of modern Orthodox and ultra-Orthodox leaders and right-wing right Zionist secular figures um, who responded, who were created not in response to the story of the 93, but in the response uh, to, to a few incidents that were making the news in Zionist Palestine um, earlier in 41, 42, um, about Jewish prostitutes who had non-Jewish customers, including um, Arab customers, and Jewish women who dated British officers. So this was a group of men, no women in this committee, who gathered in order to defend the honor of the Jewish daughters um, and also held mass meetings to try to persuade young women in Tel Aviv. Here's a photo of one of their mass meetings. Um, oh wait, this was just my illustration of what Tel Aviv, I was looking for. I couldn't find any Jewish women actually dating um, British officers, but there you see what Tel Aviv looked like in the 1940s, and there's the committee. Um, and there's the Bilu Auditorium, where the great um, meeting was held in February of 1943 that brought together all these dignitaries to fight for the honor of the Jewish daughter. Um, and this, interestingly, this particular um, meeting, 1943, in the Bilu Auditorium, took place not that far away from where the, Beis, the first Beis Yaakov was founded, on benches. So this is like Beis Yaakov girls, they, you know, the 93, they, 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 they went far. In less than 10 years, they made it to this grand auditorium, in a sense. Um, and so I'll just say the, the booklet is a compilation of speeches from this mass event. And just to give you a sense of some of the speeches, let me just really quickly, um, they speak pretty openly to what they call loose women who are supposed to be shamed into repentance by hearing about our Polish sisters, which they use that um, language a lot, who kill themselves rather than be forced to have sex with the German soldiers. And these women, whether they're prostitutes or dating British officers, are having sex with non-Jews of their own free will. Um, and the booklet ends with a plea to the confused Jewish daughter in the land of Israel, O oh, you Jew young Jewish woman, daughter of an exalted and eternal nation, while your sisters in the blood-soaked diaspora relinquish their life without fear not to be cast into shame, 
you whom divine providence has safeguarded from this cruel fate, who live free with upraised head in the land in which your nation is building a haven for refugees, is it so difficult, I feel like I hear, I don't know who, is it so difficult for the sake of your family honor for you to relinquish not your young lives, but only the chase after an easy life that can only lead to ugly maladies. I ask you, um, we beg you, O oh young Jewess, the honor of your nation is in your hands. Choose a pure life instead of staining our land, pure as an untouched flower, a family life that will carry on the chain of generations of the eternal people. This is the last line in the booklet. And let me just show you who was on this particular list. This is really quite an astonishing committee. Um, the chief rabbi of Rome, who was uh, a refugee in Jerusalem during those years, Rabbi David Prato, um, the uh, revisionist literary critic, uncle of Amosos, Yosef Klausner, um, and the um, Rabbi Moshe Blau, the uh, director of Agudas Yisrael, um, which had recently broken with, um, was part of a coalition called the Eda Haredis, the ultra-Orthodox Union, had just recently broken with the Natura Karta, and the Natura Karta was headed by Moshe Blau's brother, Amram Blau. So what you see here is quite an astonishing and interesting committee, and if anybody finds the minutes to the committee meetings, I would have loved to hear it. Um, so the way they talked about it, I think I'll just uh, very quickly, uh, maybe I'll skip all that. Say at this mass meeting, there were two women, um, and one, the first, uh, called on women to add another candle to their Shabbos candles for the 93. Um, and this, by the way, was done all around the world. And as a matter of fact, many women in particular undertook to say Kaddish for the 93. And there was still one woman after 50, 60, 70 years doing it in Williamsburg, New York, um, up until the 1990s or something like that. So this was a, a, a way in which, obviously this was an incredibly emotional and moving um, uh, gathering. There was one Beis Yaakov teacher who spoke on behalf of Benosa Gudas Yisrael, the youth movement, and what she said is, the reason why these girls were able to martyr themselves is because they had a Beis Yaakov education. Um, that's what gave them the strength. Um, and that was the only mention of Beis Yaakov in all the speeches. Let me just really quickly move to 1947. 1947 is a totally different story. Um, 1947, the booklet is produced by and for Beis Yaakov, by Mayor, um, uh, how could I have just forgotten his name, Mayor Sharansky, the founder in 1934 of the first Beis Yaakov in the land of Israel. Um, he's everywhere. Beis Yaakov is everywhere. Um, every page has some kind of advertisement for Beis Yaakov. Bechol in Yonei Banot, Lufnot, Beit Yaakov, Tel Aviv, Rechov, Grusenberg, Steim. So this is how you find the Beis Yaakov. This is the central office. This is where you send your girls. Um, Base and, search, and here's pictures of Beis Yaakov girls. There's a picture of what Grusenberg II looks like now. Um, and maybe I'll just skip to some of this. I'll just show you. Well, OK, I'll, I'll talk about this. The main, um, so let's say the main and most interesting difference between the two booklets is that the 1947 one produces another version of what happened in the ghetto in 1942, the summer of 1942. Um, it produces an eyewitness account by someone named Chana Weiss, who apparently is writing, and she gives many details that are lacking in the original letter, and she gives a, an account that goes on for many pages, which I won't uh, recite for you, um, but she sent this letter, ostensibly from Bogota, Colombia, um, to Mayor Sharansky, um, providing all the details that were missing. And she bemoans the fact that she herself did not merit joining her sisters and friends in death. Um, but she was in an alleyway where she heard what was said um, as the girls were trying to, were preparing for their death. Um, 
And I'm just going to give you a little taste of what she says in her account. So um, she describes how the director, a female director that she doesn't name, she calls upon the students to be strong. She says, my dear daughters, the time has come for you to show that you can carry out what you have learned, for you are God-fearing girls. The merits of our mother, Surish Nehru, may she rest in peace, will surely protect us so that we can withstand the trial that awaits us. Her voice was choked with tears. The hushed weeping of dozens of girls could be heard, but not a single one broke the holy silence. Suddenly there was a sound of rough footsteps and there appeared in the doorway the SS soldiers, their savage laughter interrupting the holy thoughts of the girls. You have three hours to prepare and then you will all be removed from there. The words of the SS leader thundered like the roar of a lion in the deep jungle, etc., etc. The preparations proceed, the cries grew louder, and then the youngest child asks, my dear teacher, I don't understand. What do you mean they intend to defile us? Oh, that's the word I needed before, defile. Um, the teacher embraced her. She hugged her tight and cried tearfully, my dear pure child, you don't even know. Oh, almighty God, help me carry out my plan. Many girls wept, etc. The director continued. It goes on like this for many pages. Okay, there's no doubt that this letter is as fictional as the first one. It's not only that Chaya Feldman and Hannah Weiss are the Jane Doe of Eastern European Jewish womanhood. Um, we know for sure that the director of the seminary from 1933 until it was dissolved during the war was Yehuda Leib or Leon, who would hardly have spoken to his female students about the honor of our bodies and souls, um, so, who was an unnamed female teacher. So what do we make of this, I think, astonishing story, which now has receded from Beis Yaakov imagination? Um, even though when I was in Beis Yaakov, decades before you, this was still part of the school assembly, the story of the 93, the letter, the last will and testament of the 93 would be read at um, assemblies. It functions somewhat as I can almost say, whatever passes for sex education in Beis Yaakov. Um, and it's certainly people cried when this letter was read. But what did it mean then in the 1940s? Um, I mean, one thing that we can point out is that um, it, it reached, for a certain short period, it reached a much larger audience than the narrow Beis Yaakov audience that eventually would receive this story and take it as part of its own culture. Um, and how do we understand that? The fact that it was able to reach the chief rabbi of Rome, a secular literary critic. Um, and I think it's maybe significant uh, that the Agudas Yisrael had some um, experience in finding these coalitions, particularly around the issue of girls' purity. So for instance, in 1927, Leo Deutschlander, who administered Beis Yaakov's financial uh, uh, operations, attended an, a, a conference of organizers against the international white slave trade um, and found financial support for Beis Yaakov because it was a bulwark precisely around such travesties. Um, in that respect, the Tel Aviv uh, Committee for the Defense of the, was a kind of inheritor of certain practices that had been used by Beis Yaakov in the interwar period um, in Europe. By 1947, for some reason, such alliances no longer seemed possible or were important. And it seems at least possible that the, fa the fame of the Warsaw Ghetto fighters um, and their status as the exemplary heroes of the Holocaust played a part in erasing the memory of the 93. But certainly by the early 1950s, scholars had come to a consensus that the story was fictional and people in the secular world or outside the Beis Yaakov had, had more or less dropped it. Um, but 
Beis Yaakov really did need to assert its connections to the lost homeland. And this is a page of the um, 1947 booklet. This picture of Sarah Schneer, and then it says her daughters. Um, and it seems to me to be very important that um, this woman here um, was uh, on the left. She's actually not a teacher, but a student, giving a sort of student class. This is 1928 in Rabka. Um, during a professional, summer professionalization program. And there she is, a better photo of her. Um, this woman, um, Latka Sharanska, Sharansky, is Mayor Sharansky's sister, who did not survive in the Holocaust, as it says, Hagaveris Latza Sharanska Votsiaz. Hey, you Dalid, Hashem Yikom Dama. This is Sharansky's sister. There is something. He doesn't say, he refers to Sarah Schneer, but he himself was an orphaned member of, let's say, the Besiako family, even if he was working in some sense behind the scenes. And I just want to point out that that corner of the building that you see here, wait, where is it? See this building here? Um, I went to Poland this summer with the film crew and we went to all these towns and we looked for the building. We found this building and there's a picture of me and our crew behind us. We interviewed the guy who still lived in the building, which hasn't been renovated since 1928 when that photo was taken. And um, he remembered the girls that had been, um, that had come there every summer. And I just want to say that my own S talking about a story that's fictional does not mean that I feel as if this is not an important commemorative, commemorative research project. So um, it's personally important to me, and I think it's personally important for to Besiako. Memory is always, let's say, a kind of um, constructive em enterprise, always under construction. And this is part of the constructive enterprise of Besiakov history, which is also in which Besiakov memory, even when it isn't entirely accurate, plays an important part. Okay, so let me just find a good way to wrap this up. Um, so this story is an important part of what keeps Besiakov together. Um, the picture here is. Um, the 80th Yartzeit gathering for Sarah Schneer. Were you ever at a Yartzeit gathering for Sarah Schneer? Do they do it in Minneapolis? So, oh, Zoom. So in, in Brooklyn and in Jerusalem and in major Beis Yaakov centers, you have mass gatherings. This one, there were 30,000 girls and women at Barclays Center in Brooklyn. Um, this is something that people don't know about, right? They think ultra-Orthodox or... or those are just men. I don't know how they imagine that these men reproduce, but maybe through their black hats. Or, um, and that these women have their own distinctive culture, that they venerate a female figure, that they carry out a kind of memory, and, the, and that this persists through gatherings in which there are no men. Um, this, of course, is Sarah Schneer's gravesite uh, put up in Krakow by Beis Yaakov alumni. As I said, you're a Beis Yaakov girl for your whole life. Okay, so what should I say? This, this is an unusual chapter in Holocaust history, and I think it's a case study for a lot of different things that I've only begun to explore. Um, and one of them is the role that was played, I think the surprising role that was played um, in ultra-Orthodox perceptions of the Holocaust um, of sexual violence, and in particular of the violation of girls and women. Um, during the period in which the Holocaust was actually unfolding, as opposed to much later when feminist Holocaust historians are discovering women talking about it. Um, so this is not only interesting, interesting because it's happening and unfolding in real time, but also because it continues to our own time. That this is part of a living memory of um, the ways in which a, a, a social movement, an educational movement, um, of girls and women um, that's still very much alive in the world we live in today um, 
manages to bridge what might otherwise have been a kind of unbridgeable chasm and connect itself to their sisters in Poland. Um, I think it's also a story in which violence, sex, shame, not just the shame of girls, but also the shame of the men who are unable to protect them, um, they combine to safeguard Jewish honor and maintain Jewish, maybe Orthodox Jewish patriarchy in extremis. Thank you. Ask me anything. That's right. We've got time for questions. What do you want to know? Yeah. Are there any theories on who actually wrote either of the two letters and whether it was um, actually well thought out in terms of what they were trying to accomplish? Um, you know, this, there's a crazy answer to that story. So um, there are two books, there are two academic books about Beis Yaakov. And one of them is my book of 2019, and the other one is my father's book, which was written in Poland in the 30s. My father was commissioned to write a history of Beis Yaakov in um, 1937 after Sarasenera's death. It's called The Renaissance of the Jewish Women, Woman. So I grew up in kind of Beis Yaakov, the inner circle of the men who really ran Beis Yaakov, whose names are not remembered because it's all about Sarasenera. So um, the, a major article, the first major article about this particular incident by um, a, Holocaust, a feminist Holocaust historian named Judith Baumer, Tyler Baumel, I think her name is, um, and, and J.J. Schachter, um, they interviewed my father. And I just know this from a footnote. And it says that my father said to them that he knew who had written this letter, and he didn't want to say. And my father died in 1995, and I think about him every day. And I never asked him who wrote it. Like, I wasn't interested in writing a book about Beis Yaakov. And the one thing I do remember is that we would have these gatherings, and we would read the letter, and he would say, Narishkeit. And he would say, don't go. Don't go. So he, he hated this story. And um, I think he would even be annoyed that I was still talking about it. Um, but I think it's, there's a lot, it's very interesting, even if it's not true. So who it was, I mean, my attempt to try to figure that out is, first of all, there's a kind of front of an, a significant woman, and then there's all the men behind the scenes who are raising the money. So Serge Nera is all you talk about. And the fact that there's some dude named Leo Deutschlander or Yehuda Leibor Leon, nobody thinks about those guys because this is a women's movement and it's, it's mythical mother and all that. So I think it was, and, and these men, and the other thing is in the girls' school, they don't talk about prostitutes. I, I was shocked to find out. I think I had a slide of Eleanor Roosevelt. Eleanor Roosevelt was on the American Base Yaakov Committee. What did Eleanor Roosevelt care about? girls studying Torah. I'm sure she didn't. She was on it because she was part of some feminist circle, circuit of anti-white slave trade. Um, and they, they, Siakov raised money off of this suffragist, feminist, international circle that wasn't even Jewish. And uh, in Poland, they ne you never hear the word prostitute or anything like that. The girls don't know anything about how Besiakov is raising money. So to me, I am, my nose tells me that whoever is going to the anti-white slave trade conferences in London, and they're not sending the girls, um, that's who probably wrote. I'm guessing that's one of those guys wrote the letter. I don't know who. I'm sure it wasn't my father. He would never do that. He hated it. Um, my father worked plenty for Basiaka. He wrote plenty of letters, but he didn't write this one. Um, and I believe that he knew who it was, but I just don't know who it was. I don't think so. Thank you for saying that. Let me just say this one thing. Uh, um, this man and what's your name? Bob. Bob said it's a cynical story. I don't necessarily see it that way. I mean, I, I think we have this like very strong, this is true or this is false and whoever it is is making it up. I, don't, I see that. I think there's a lot of middle positions. 
And this, like, the pious story, the way people talked about Sarah Shner, it was like the Hasidic tale. Truth is, who knows where truth is, right? You, it, I, don't, I don't see it as cynical, um, even though I just said it was probably a fundraising ploy. It was, a, it was an, a ploy, in this case, not fundraising, but consciousness raising. Yeah. As I was listening to your talk, it was a very interesting, thank you. It seemed you relate to this story as a modern midrash. Is that the way you look at it? So I'm not the one who looks at it that way, but I, that's interesting. There's a whole, um, there's a bunch of scholars who talk about it in, as a kind of continuation of certain Talmudic midrashim, the 400 young boys who jumped into the, who were being taken to be prostitutes in Rome. In other words, you can draw a kind of Jewish lineage, as Christian as it sounds, right? Ravishing the virgins. You can draw a Jewish midrashic lineage for it. I think that that kind of um, underplays just how Beis Yaakov it is. In other words, they're, it, it's so Beis Yaakov. The reason why they're separated from their families, which is what every interwar Jewish girl wanted was to get away from her families, right? They took that impulse and they, they produced, they used it as energy to revive Jewish life, to keep them away from their families. So uh, there's that aspect of it. There's the fact that they'll be reunited with Sarah Nira. This is somebody who's, it, it's possible it has a midrashic provenance, but it's also deep in, whoever, whoever wrote this knew Beis Yaakov very, very well understood that when you speak to the man, you call her Sarah Schneer, but when you speak among the girls, you say Mama Sarah. So there's something really specific to it that I think gets missed when you just see it in these archetypal forms. Um, so I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm fine with people talking about the Midrashic, but as somebody who's so interested in the, the details of Beis Yaakov, I'm, I'm really interested in, in, in how that plays out as, as inner Beis Yaakov discourse. And what it means that a man, I'm assuming it was a man, could reproduce that so authentically, I, to some extent authentically, without it being true. <laughs> yeah. Was there a specific significance to the number 93? Excellent question. Oh, by the way, the, another reason why we think, I mean, scholars say there's no way this could have happened is that nobody seemed to know. So we know the names of a lot of, uh, teachers and, and students in the Beis Yaakov Seminary. We have photos, etc. There's no one named Chaya Feldman. No one has come forward and said, oh yeah, I know who Chaya Feldman is. But 93, I, that, you know, what an obvious question. And I have to be embarrassedly admit that I've never thought about it before. And I don't know that anyone else has either. My immediate association is that it's like, there's something satisfying about it as a number. I mean, it's a little too much. Like 93 is almost like, you know what I mean? It's not cozy. It's not like a little cozy group of girls at all. It's like too much. Like I would have thought you're going to make this up. Have it be 37. 37 is also a great number, but 93, 93 is the whole class. That's, that's how much a, a class was. Somewhere between 80 and maybe 110 for a very big class. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I should plug my website, the Basiaco Project. Um, dot com, and you'll see all the lists. I all the material that I find in my research, I immediately make available because the Orthodox world, I think, needs this information. Um, there are very few digital archives devoted to Orthodox Jewish history, and um, I'm um, I'm inclined to not keep this to myself. To in a small academic world, but there's so many amateur historians. Um, with, who contact me in the Orthodox world. I'm not talking about modern Orthodox, in the Haredi world where people don't go to college and yet they, want, they have like a real hunger for this, for this material. So I share everything and you can see all the lists. And I have lists where I have every girl that's in the seminary a certain year and the towns that they come from. And so yeah, we do have a lot of this. You know why there's a lot of information? It's because it's all fundraising. It's all the Joint Distribution Committee needed the lists. Thank God for the Joint Distribution Committee. Yeah. Slavery movement concerns and the enactment of movement 
Yep. That whole idea that girls are kind of the weak link, um, certainly true. Uh, by the way, the whole historical question of, I just rely on the scholars at Yad Vashem. They're, the consensus is clear, no evidence, any names. There's no Chai Feldman, there's no Hannah Weiss, there's no, none of this has, 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 has shown any, uh, and I just rely on other people's scholarship who are a lot more historians than I am. In terms of this particular trope of the Jewish girl, this, the first rabbinical conference you know, in modernity held in Krakow in 1903, um, convened by the rabbi, the Ashkenazi rabbi of Alexandria, of, was it Cairo or Alexandria, of Egypt. Um, the first discussion was about this. What are we going to do about these girls that don't want to be orthodox anymore? What do we do with these girls that are being wooed or seduced or false marriages or volunteer. The whole question of like how exactly you became a prostitute is an excellent question. And yes, it's still going on. I have a, um, you know, some sort of Kach type organization like has like police tape and puts out Aravi Alte'ez Afilu Lachshova Yehudia. That same you know, we're, we're holding the fort, but these girls, they're empty headed. So they're the danger. Um, and uh, I, I didn't mention Bertha Pappenheim, who was the, the most famous Jewish feminist fighter against the white slave trade, which I think we should stop calling it that. So, so tr sex traffic, let's just call it sex traffic. She helped organize all over the Jewish world, in Europe, in America. A girl gets off a train, a young woman gets off a train. There's a traveler's aid desk that helps her. So she's not going to go off with some guy who claims to want to date her, um, which is how apparently this happened a lot. Um, so Bertha Pappenheim was on the board of, was, it, was Sarah Schneer as a consultant in the Beis Yaakov movement. Well, are there a lot more questions? Maybe I should just let people ask questions. They're so interesting. Sure. Yevon Mitsula. Um, yes. Yeah, there were all sorts of earlier stories. So was this kind of right. the Jewish lineage? Or? There's an internal, so did Beis Yaakov, the question was, for those of you who didn't hear, did Beis Yaakov itself create a kind of tradition of feminine martyrology? Mm -hmm. And um, one of the things I do on the website is basically documents. So Beis Yaakov had, uh, the Beis Yaakov Journal, which is uh, the longest running Jewish women's uh, publication in interwar Poland, I think including all languages and ethnic groups. And they regularly had scenes from Jewish history. It wasn't a huge thing. In other words, martyrology was not a huge thing. Sarah Schneer's motto, despite Chaya Feldman's letter, was Ivdu Hashem Besimcha or Ivdu Hashem Besimcha. And it wasn't, um, and you should also sacrifice yourself. So self-sacrifice, especially not self, uh, that kind of sexual self-sacrifice, was not a big topic. I found two, I found one story about some legendary woman that was dragged by horses for turning down a, it, 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 it makes an appearance in a parrot story too, um, where she pins the dress to herself um, in order that she not, her dress not fly up as she's being torn to pieces. So. There is that story in the Beis Yaakov Journal, and what's also a little bit crazy is that there was a suicide at the, um, sorry, trigger warning, but at the, at the Beis Yaakov Seminary sometime in the 30s, I think while Sarah Schneer was still alive, and they were trying to figure out whether some girl had fallen or jumped, and 
the police noticed that she had actually somehow tried to not pin but tie her dress to herself, which is why they concluded it was a suicide. Um, I think I found one other possible so yes, this tradition of Jewish martyrology, um, not huge in Beis Yaakov. I think it was probably bigger after the Holocaust. Did you have your hand up? Should we let you ask a question? So Someone who actually might know a little something? I, I've never actually said this first, so that's kind of my question, but just first, thank you. And my, my thought, first thought is similar to what Ed Ramsmore said about how such a big, story can be crafted. I know that they say, I think, I forget which um, commentary says this, but like every lie has, every lie has to have some truth in it. And this just sounds like, how can 93 people like committing suicide, like how come nobody would ever like hear of that or know of that or like be around? Of course it was the Holocaust. I'm like, you know, it's not really like news stations going around, but I just, it's like an anomaly how this could have been crafted. And another one of my questions is you mentioned that like at, throughout kind of base Yaakov school system, they used to be in your day that this was a big thing always talked about and then it kind of just like slowly disappeared. And is that based on the evidence coming forward that it's not true or is more the, the kind of like shunning of talking about anything that has to do with like sexual activity and as I know from being in base <laughs> I, you're right, there's something immodest about the story, which is, you know, again, why it's so shocking that it appeared. Um, that's, I think, uh, that's got to be part of it. And I, if I remember correctly, there was a certain age at which they told you the story. It wasn't, and there wasn't a huge Holocaust memorial culture in Basiaqua and Borough Park. I don't know if there was uh, for you. Uh, Holocaust memorial, Holocaust memorializing. It wasn't a big thing. I mean, on yeah. uh, Tish above, maybe a little bit. Um, there, yeah, there was no, like, Yom HaShoah. I mentioned it once. No, of course like, not. Oh, yeah. But we did do, like, a whole year of Holocaust study and Holocaust projects, and, and definitely they say, like, Tish above is the day to remember yeah. the Holocaust. Yeah, yeah. And so Tish above doesn't happen during the school year, right. so. So um, I think a lot of it has to do with the fact that the story, that in Beis Yaakov, it's now well known that scholars don't believe the story. And how, how much you could keep pushing a story when you know that a lot of people, and n other than this Hannah Weiss that came through, no one else seems to, right? I mean, there's a lot of survivor circles um, where you know stories can get passed along. And I have heard stories that, you know, you hear it from one person and then from another. And this one, no, this one, there's this one document and then the belated eyewitness. Yeah. Um, one comment, one question. Uh, I had never heard of this until you presented possible topics. And then shortly thereafter, it was Tisha B'Av. And after our own uh, keynotes in the morning, I went uh, over to the base to go hear the, uh, the different rabbinim in the community introducing in the keynote for a couple extra hours. And uh, it came up like a davar yadua, like a known quantity. Somebody introduced it, it was a keynote in 93, and this happened. So, so people are still saying it happened in Minneapolis in 2022. One, uh, just one bump in a, in a Tisha keynote service uh, six months ago. So now I'm doing a double, because you know, I thought when I heard that, it's, oh, you mentioned the 93, and they mentioned, so everyone must know. Everybody this. must know the 23. No, no, no. Uh, so my question is, pushback for your research, your work? What, what's the word on the uh, Haredi street about, about your research? How's it going? Very, thank you for that question. I also didn't know like what was going to happen. And actually, so I don't know if people know this. I'm wearing a long skirt, but maybe you figured it out. I'm no longer orthodox. And I was really, um, that's actually what my podcast is about, is an attempt to create bridge bridges. Have you heard it? No. Heretic in the house. So I didn't know what, how I would be accepted, and I didn't know whether I was going to say that I wasn't Orthodox anymore, like in the introduction, and whether that I would, I didn't know, like, either, like, I'll be put in cherem, and maybe I'll get more of my books sold, or, and I thought, who's going to, who's going to read my books if not the Orthodox community? And then I thought, I know the Orthodox community, and everybody knows everything about everyone, 
And if they don't know that I'm not orthodox now, they'll know next week, because word gets out. So I just decided to say so in the first sentence. In the, it's actually the second sentence of my, um, I think the first sentence is something like, it seems very important for me to say who I am in this book. And who I am is, I went to Beis Yaakov, you know, I went to three or four different Beis Yaakovs, but I left the Orthodox world when I was 18 and I no, no longer consider myself part of it. That's what I say. And then the rest of it is just an academic book. And I really didn't know, and my mother asked me not to dedicate the book to her as I wanted to. And I understood, she's like, I don't know, you know, and then she's like, you're gonna say it's a fem, you're gonna say Sarah Schneer was a feminist. I'm like, I don't say Sarah Schneer was a feminist, no. Um, and she was very nervous about it. And then I gave her a copy of the book, you know, I didn't dedicate it to her, but I signed it and I gave it to her. And, and I, you know, like a couple of weeks later, I'm like, so did you like the book? And, and my mother said, Someone took the book. So I have, like, my mother, who lives alone, you know, some, whatever, one of my many nieces, you know, the dozens of nieces and nephews are like, oh, what's this? And then I, so I sent my mother another copy of the book, and then she's like, people keep stealing the book. <laughs> so I had to give my mother, like, a few copies. I basically was giving the book out to my extended family, which you can imagine what that is. And then I was like, okay, so did you read it? And she's like, I'm very busy. And then she looks at me and she says, but the Rebbitson really liked the book. <laughs> and I have to say that my mother, we davened in, a, I don't know where my mother davens now, but when I was growing up, we davened in the Satmar Stiebel. So we're talking, I don't know if that's the Rebbitson, but so we're talking about like a major, and then I started hearing back from people and like I said, I'm not in the closet. I'm not pretending to be anyone I'm not. And, I, you know, my email box is full of, you know, just these people from the Orthodox community who are, who are treat, like really interested in, do you know anything about this Agudanik that you mentioned? And, and can you tell us more? I'm really curious. My uncle is this guy you mentioned in this particular Beis Yaakov, and how do I find out more information? And I just started realizing what a hunger there is, especially among ultra-Orthodox men, more than women for some reason. Maybe because they're not as busy, but um, <laughs> sorry, I got a little worked up here. Um, I'm actually, if you know any, so I, uh, I have access, one of the archives that I worked with is like the uh, ultra -orth is is basically what I think is the best Orthodox archive, and it's in the basement of a 90-year-old's house in the Orthodox community in Toronto. And I'm desperately looking for some really rich person to buy this archive, and then the University of Toronto will acquire the best Orthodox archive in the world. It's the Berenbaum archive. Nathan Berenbaum, Schleimer Berenbaum, Oreo Berenbaum, is this re ringing a bell? Great all this material, and it's a handwritten catalog. And you look at this guy, he just looks like your average yeshivish guy. His grandfather coined the term Zionism. We have seven letters from Sarah Schneer to his father, um, 70 letters from Theodor Herzl to his grandfather, but okay, I'm less interested in that. Um, and I'm just, th this is, is lacking. It's in a basement in an Orthodox neighborhood and people don't know about this history because, because whatever, the, the Orthodox world and archives, it just isn't the natural fit. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. Let's do uh, one more question. I have a question about Amos Oliver and Paul here in the committee. Yeah. Um, do you remember Philip Evil Council? Amos Oliver? I. I I'm not sure I read that one. I mean, I own it, but that's not quite the same thing, is it? The mother was a British um, soldier. <gasps> at the end, and it's very, I'm um, talking about triggering. It's, a, it's, I mean, it, it's creepy, but I just want oh to my God. you put this together with the <gasps> Oh, my God. Okay, you gave me a research topic. It's just a, it's really a short one. I know. Like I said, I own it. I should open it and read it. Oh, Oz and Klausner, I mean, Oz, Oz like left his revisionist family and moved to a kibbutz when he was 15 or something. So it wasn't, it wasn't good. no, he, he admired and loved his, his uncle, but 
this, this is a weird kind of, uh, you know, talk about coalition politics. This is coalition politics in the 40s between orthodox, the ultra-orthodox, the right wing, and I don't know what David Prato is doing there. Someone's got to figure that part out. I guess just, I don't know anything about David Prato. I have to figure that out, who, what, what his role was. He was actually the chair of the whole committee. I think maybe he was just like a bridge. You know, otherwise, what is Moshe Blau going to have to say to Josef Klausner? You got to have someone, a third party, who's like a mediator, who has status, and this kind of isn't part of that Ashkenazi fight. I think that must be how it worked out, but I, that's just a guess. Well, I'm sure we can continue this. Thank you.